just want to let you know, Florida's been rocking like low 80s, and uh, I'm going down this next week. <laughs> Have fun. Um, no, um, we'll be on, co family will be on vacation. I'll miss the next two Sundays, so looking forward to having Greg, one of our elders, uh, preach next week. Um, it's going to be a, a one sermon in three parts about the Trinity. Thank you. I it got, got a few laughs in the prayer meeting. I thought I'd try it again. Uh, and then, and then Jaden's going to be preaching uh, the week after that, and I, I look forward to be back with you guys on Easter. Also, speaking of Easter, it's coming up, so I would invite you, um, look, we're to, I, I recognize this about myself, I'm not like um, into the church year, as may, maybe as much as I should be, right? And so this idea of Lent and like intentionally preparing yourself for Easter, and so Easter is the holiday that sneaks up on me, and so I, I would like to ask you guys, don't let it, let's, let's let it not sneak up on us, and let's be preparing for maybe the biggest celebration of the Christian year. And so please be praying, like be praying that God would do whatever he wants to do in your life and be praying for those that, and this is a great season for people that maybe walked away from Christ, on the fence with Christ, to hear about the good news, the central point of the gospel. So I just would ask you to please uh, join in prayer in the next couple of weeks as we uh, prepare for celebrating Easter. Uh, you can also help celebrate Easter by bringing snacks, uh, filling up Easter eggs. I, I was a little catch-22 on that one because I don't want that much candy at home. I think last year we brought home like 10 pounds of candy from that one. But uh, uh, please, uh, some bags out in the floor. You can fill them up for Easter eggs. And then the last thing with Easter, I want to implore you, not only pray and if you want to help bring candy for the little ones, but also if uh, you are invited to come early during Easter, we'll have some snacks out. So just to come and celebrate and, and spend some extra time with your church family, eating some snacks and, and encouraging one another. So that's what I have for announcements today. Uh, my family's home, not feeling well today, so which is great right before vacation. Um, but uh, Logan, would you come up and lead us in prayer? And, and worship team, you can come up as well, and we'll get worship started today. All right, let us pray. Dear God, thank you for today. Even though it's cold, it's still a chance for us to just come together and to worship you together, Lord. And we thank you for that freedom, for that opportunity. Uh, Lord, we also pray for uh, the Corona Church, um, as they're one of our sister churches in the UB, Lord. Church is not a, a single body, but a global body, Lord. And I just pray that you would be with them and help them um, and help their leader, Michael. And just, I, I know what is on their heart is Russia, Lord. and and Ukraine, and, and that situation. And that can seem so far away, Lord, but you are in control. And we just pray that your will would be done over there, that lives would be saved, that people, the innocents would not be hurt more than need be. Lord, I also just pray for endurance for us as pastors, preaching on that today it's easy to feel beat down by the world but you give us the endurance to survive you give us what we need and you give us you promise us that you will not give us more than we can bear and we thank you for that promise i just pray all these things in your son's mighty and powerful name amen belongs to Jesus Christ. Oh, thank you, Caleb. There we are. Hey, the battle always belongs to Jesus. So let's worship him this morning. Let's, let's surrender to him the things that we're dealing with. Let's give to him the things that we struggle with. And let's let him be our strength. Let's worship him this morning. see is the battle you see the victory when all I see is a mountain you see a mountain move and as I walk through the shadow your love surrounds me
There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. So when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. the cross, God, you see the empty tomb. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh, God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh, God, the battle belongs to you. In Almighty Fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. In Almighty Fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. In Almighty Fortress, God, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God. The battle belongs to you, and every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. from the clouds a strange and lovely sound I hear it in the thunder and the rain it's ringing in the skies like cannons in the night as the music of the universe plays we're singing you are holy you great and mighty the moon and the stars declare who you are i'm so unworthy but still you love me forever my heart 
we'll sing of how great you are. This is beautiful and free, the song of galaxies. It's reaching far beyond the Milky Way. Let's join in with the sound. Come on, let's sing it out as the music of the universe plays. We're singing, You are holy, Lord, you're great in mind. The moon and the stars declare who you are. I'm so unworthy, but still you love me forever. My heart will sing of how great all glory, honor, power is yours. Amen. All glory, honor, power is yours. Amen. All glory, honor, power is yours. Forever on me. We're singing, You are holy, You great and mighty. The moon and the stars declare who You are. I'm so unworthy, but still. stars declare who you are I'm so unworthy but still you love me forever my heart will see of how great you search the world but it couldn't fill me man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough then you came along you put me back together now every desire is now satisfied hearing you love oh there's nothing better than you there's nothing better than you Lord. there's nothing nothing is better than you Now I'm not afraid To show you my weakness My failures and flaws Lord, you've seen them all And you still call me free Cause the God of the mountains Is the God of the valley now there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again oh there's nothing better than you there's nothing better than you lord there's nothing 
thing Nothing is better than you Oh, there's nothing Better than you There's nothing Better than you Oh, there's nothing Nothing is better than you You turn morning to dancing You give beauty for ashes You turn shame into glory You're the only one who can You turn mourning to dancing You give beauty for ashes You turn shame into glory You're the only one who can You turn graves into cotton You turn bones into armies You turn seas into highways You're the only one who can You turn graves into cotton you turn bones into army You turn seas into highway You're the only one who can You're the only one who can You're the only one who can Oh, there's nothing Better than you, there's nothing Better than you, Lord, there's nothing Oh, nothing is better than you Oh, there's nothing Better than you, there's nothing Better than you, Lord, there's nothing Nothing is better than you Lord God, there is nothing better than you You are great You are mighty Every battle belongs to you Lord, no matter what we are going through We know that you are sovereign we know that you love us. We know that you are strong. And that you give beauty in the ashes. And Lord, because you are the only one who can, we worship you. Lord, we praise you. We praise you that you gave your life for us that we can have a right relationship with you, that we can be a part of your family, part of your kingdom. God, you are mighty. No one is stronger, no one is better than you. Father, we love you, and it's your name we pray and worship. Amen. Hey, church family, will you turn to someone? Will you wish them a wonderful morning?
Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Hey, uh, don't do the video, guys. Uh, that was very good. Well, okay, welcome. Lisa, you, you raise your hand. Would you like to share something, sister? Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Praise God. Yeah. Thank you, sister. Not much to say beyond that besides saying praise God, being living, active, powerful, and answering prayers, and still healing and working miracles. We can. We don't. We we dare not forget that, should we? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Praise God. Um, in high school. Uh, it may not, may, may not look it now, but I, I was an athlete middle school and high school years, and I was, oh, I deserve that, mm-hmm. yep, um, you know, I was, I was a wrestler, and uh, I got to, to wrestle in a tournament uh, my freshman year, and, you know, wrestling tournaments are an all-day affair. Um, you have multiple matches, and, and I went in feeling pretty good, wrestled my round robins, you know, and, and they put, then you put in a tournament bracket. And I started winning through the bracket. I was doing pretty good. And I got to the semifinals of this tournament. And I was doing, feeling pretty good most of the day, but uh, about that half an hour, 40 minutes before, oh my gosh, I forgot. Matt, <laughs> picture. Um, before, about the half an hour before that match, you know, you get some leg time between to let your body rest and to rotate people through the mats. I, I started feeling awful. Just, I started feeling miserable. I was in the bathroom, like, dry heaving and shaking. I just, like, man, I don't know what happened. I just couldn't understand it. I was feeling absolutely miserable. And so, you know, Dad was working, and Mom was there. Mom, I don't know what's going on. I think I came down with something. You know, like, right before my semifinal match. She looks at me and says, I, I don't think you're sick. I just think you're nervous. <laughs> I learned something about myself that day. I would lost confidence. As the day went on before that match. And, and I want to reference that to segue into talking about confidence. Talking about confidence as a Christian. Confidence so that we can step out into the wrestling mat without fear. Confidence so that when we step into the ring, we know we're going to win. And brothers and sisters, God looks at us and says, Church, believers, you can have confidence. That you can walk the Christian life with success. Confidence that allows us to know that we have been faithful and we will be faithful come what may. God says we can and should have it. It's our birthright as believers to have confidence. Conversely, though, we can lose confidence. And that's part of the warning here today in Scripture. So we can lose confidence. We can lose it away. So today we're going to look at the dire warning found in Hebrews um, chapter 10, verses 26 through 31. So here it is on the screen. It says, For if we go on sinning deliberately at Receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for you too. Come on now, we're working on the channel. You do, Jaden. Snap your fingers, make a wish, make this thing work right. <laughs> Bling, bling. I feel like I have a cell phone, like the old school cell phone. I feel like I'm really white and nerdy now. All right. Self-deprecation, check. All right. 
there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation for judgment. And uh, check this. I mean, these are strong words, right? And a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned, by the, blo profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace? For we know him who said, vengeance is mine and I'll repay, repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Man, what an opening uh, set of scriptures for us today. And as we work through the book of Hebrews, he gives this dire warning. Now, one of the weaknesses to the way we approach the scriptures, right? We, we're working through the book of Hebrews. We're going to spend nigh on a year doing it. Is that, again, we can lose the big picture. So let me just remind you that this is not the first time in the book of Hebrews we've heard warnings along this lines, right? We've told in Hebrews 2.1, be careful lest you drift away. Hebrews 3.7, do not harden your hearts. Hebrews 4.1, let us... Fear, lest we fail to reach the promised rest. Hebrews 6, 1. It's impossible for those who are once enlightened to be restored to repentance. And these are real dangers. And often the results of ignoring the commands like we heard last week, right? The let us passages. Uh, chiefly what I really highlighted on, do not forsake the gathering of other, of other believers. Hebrews 10, 25. Dire warnings spoken to what seems like the church about deliberately sinning. And so what do we, how do we process this? And again, if you remember through the book of Hebrews, the Hebrew comes to a conclusion on this, which is this is not a dire warning for, ev for the believer who commits a sin. This is a warning against apostasy, the rejection of the Christian faith that you once claimed. Or, I would add to that, believing such a twisted form of the gospel that it is no longer the real gospel, right? It's the gospel in name, but not the gospel in substance. And we can say that in confidence, again, because of the context in Hebrews, and because, look, the forgiveness of sins, of any sin, is available to the believer. The scriptures are very clear about that, right? As a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, covered by the grace of God, every sin I have commit, am committing, and will commit will be covered by the blood and forgiven. And we can rest solidly on that one. As Robert Rayburn says, deliberately keep on sinning refers not to the immense sinfulness that remains in every believer's life, over which one mourns, or which one repents, and for which one turns to, sorry, which one turns to Christ, but to the rejection of faith. So he's, again, warning about the danger of apostasy. But let me talk about apostasy for a moment. Apostasy for many of us is thought of as a far off destination, right? Um, apostasy is like going to Florida. It's a long ways away. I'm never going to get there. But I want to remind you of the slide that we went through that we use often in the book of ephesians the whole last half of ephesians is comparing the two paths in life and the two selves right you are either on the path that leads to life or the path that leads to death you are either born anew in christ a new believer with different priorities values loving people serving god and that's on the new path to the new life or you're the old self self-interest living for pleasure or avoiding pain and that's a path that leads to death there's only two paths in life and only two selves in life and i bring this back up again to remind us that i don't know anybody who has magically woken up and rejecting and rejected a god that they loved fiercely the day before I know many people who have walked away from the Lord, and I'm sure you do too, right? You know people have walked away. But what, I, what tends to characterize them is there's compromise ahead of that. Rejection isn't there. I've never known someone to walk away from the faith who didn't have a history of a compromise. Maybe they were lukewarm in their faith. Maybe they weren't regularly in, the prayer, in prayer or in the scriptures. Maybe they indulged and justified sin in their lives. Maybe, that, maybe they weren't engaged in transparent relationships with mature believers. Maybe they were not receiving God's forgiveness nor extending God's forgiveness. Maybe they were not actually loving and serving people, but their faith was just a matter of their minds and of intellect and in their sheltered environment. And again, they've maybe failed to obey some of the clear commands of Scripture. And again, I'm not saying that you have to be perfect, but I'm saying we on a road and on a destination and on a bunch of little compromises on the back end of those we find destruction typically let me give you a phrase it's not up on the screen but it's one i if you're a note taker write this one down i think it's an important idea for us which is this it's upon the million little decisions that your life is built it's upon the million little decisions that your life is built 
Life, your life is not made of the big decisions that you made. Those aren't really the things that make your life up. It's the million little decisions. Let me illustrate that. If you compromise in the small ways, you're going to compromise on the big stuff eventually. You see it classically. I never, I never cheat on my spouse. But if you watch something, think about something, text someone, pursue something, you know, it's, I never get there. And a million little compromises, and through a million little compromises, the unthinkable action becomes the normal action, the logical next step. Why is that? Why are the million little decisions so important, and I would argue of more importance than the big ones? Because, check this, in the million little decisions, you shape your character, you shape your faith, you shape your willpower, and you shape your uh, discernment. In the million little decisions, you shape your character. You shape who you become. What kind of person am I? And that's tested and proven on the little decisions in life. How do I respond in conflict? That tests and shapes my character. If I respond to conflict poorly, I begin shaping my character. It tests my faith. If I don't have enough faith to take the little step, then I'm never going to have enough faith to take the big step. And if I'm willing, if I continue to step back and shy away on my faith in the little steps, then I've cultivated a weak faith without the courage and strength to take the big ones. It, comp it, just, it um, shapes my willpower. If I don't have the ability to resist the temptations to sin in little ways, then how in the heck am I going to resist the big ones? I've shaped my willpower to one that is easy to say yes instead of a hardened, firm, steadfast willpower to say, I will not compromise, I will not surrender, and it shapes my discernment. If I have the inability to judge accurately with a biblical worldview what is right in these small decisions and in these small areas of my life, then of course I'm going to be taken for the big ones. Because I haven't trained my mind to think biblically about all of my life. So I tell you again, brothers and sisters, it's upon the million little decisions that your life is built. And we get into this trap that I, I can compromise here, I can compromise there, but I never compromise on the big ones. That is a lie from Satan. This is one of, one of the reasons why Jesus teaches us that even looking is lust. Or even being angry with your brother, call him you fool, is sin. Because you are shaping your heart. You're shaping your character in those small and inward places. That's why I have on my board a quote right from the Col um, from Chuck Colson, I've modified. He says, faithfulness, not success. And I put faithfulness is success. That's why I want to remind myself that my job as a believer is to be faithful in every area of my life as much as I can be. Lord, help me to be faithful in all the small things. And let me remind you, brothers and sisters, of this truth, that if you are faithful in the small things, the big things will often be taken care of. Faithfulness in the small things will often avoid some of the big crisis decisions, and faithfulness in the small things is the best preparation for faithfulness in the big things. Because I've shaped my character, faith, willpower, and discernment. So we talk about apostasy here, right? Apostasy is this far-off thing. My appeal to you is apostasy might be closer than you think because of the way that you're shaping your character today in the small decisions that you make. We see here, right? For those of you who go on deliberately sinning. So we need to fight for faithfulness. Now, I do, I'm going to do the same thing with apostasy. I've broadened that, tried to bring that closer to home. Let me do the same thing with deliberately sinning here. Because I have yet to meet any Christian that is honest enough to say, yeah, I deliberately did that. Like, I knew it was a sin, but I did it anyways. What we tend to do is we put this veneer over it and say, like, well, I tried, but I didn't. And let me caveat what I'm going to teach and say, there are times, right, when our willpower fails us. I am I believe that every Christian sins and falls into sin at times. Sometimes our willpower breaks, but I believe every single time God gives us everything we need to overcome the sin, right? So we always have the ability. We often fail in that. So I just want to be gracious to us when we legitimately fail in sin. But let me talk about this deliberately sinning and broaden it for a second. What if deliberately sinning meant you gave no real effort or no effective effort? Well, let me illustrate what I mean by this. Um, I have young kids, and if you've been around young kids before, there is a unique challenge that young kids face uh, that older people don't, um, and, and it's, some, it's a challenge they face each and every day, sometimes multiple times a day. You know what that challenge is? Taking off and putting on clothes. Okay, um, you, know, you know, it's, it's extra challenging for young kids to 
take off and put on their clothes, especially shirts, because their heads are disproportionately big compared to the rest of their bodies. And so, um, and so what, I, I, what I've seen as a dad, right, I look at one of my kids and say, hey, I need you to, I need you to take off your shirt so you can get changed. And now I know they can do it because they did it yesterday. And they'll look, they'll go, okay, uh, uh, and they'll make that noise, uh, I tried that, I can't do it. No, no, give it your best effort and take off the shirt. Uh, I can't, just do it for me, dad. And, and I wonder sometimes, right, like, that, I look at them and say, no, like, you're deliberately failing. Like, I've asked you to do it, you give such minimal effort that it's a deliberate fail. Like, you can't say you tried, you, I tried, but it's so little. And I think, brothers and sisters, I wonder sometimes if we deliberately sin in this way. We say, well, I tried a little bit, God. Ugh. I don't really want to do it. <laughs> Hebrews, in chapter 12, he says this. Consider him, Jesus, who endured from sinners such hostility against himself. So consider Jesus and the hostility he'd endured, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. John's the church. Consider Jesus and what he suffered so that you don't grow weary and faint-hearted. And then he gives this zinger. Check this out. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet ex- resisted to the point of shedding blood. Oh, doggy. What kind of effort is he calling the church to there? I just want to remind us, when the gospel calls us to resist sin and to live a life of holiness... The expectation is that you do it to the point of shedding blood. They're talking about here persecution and martyrdom, going to the Colosseum and being fed to lions and burned. Like that was a test of faithfulness to the early church. And you're, you're, the expectation for the believers that you go in there like a man and you take it and you do it, giving glory and honor to the Lord, not shy back. And that's his challenge to us. Brothers and sisters, some of us, some of us retreat before we've been bled. We enter the battle and say, oh man, Things are getting kind of hard around here. I don't want to bleed, so I'm going to run away. Sometimes we fail to go to war against sin, and we fail to take it seriously in our, life, in our lives. We compromise in those little ways, and thus, I would challenge us, maybe, just maybe, we can fall into this deliberately sinning trap. I'm preaching it hard today because this is the scriptures. Please know that me and God have some wrestling with this one because I had to look in the mirror, just so you know. This is not a spot of... There are times where I have to catch myself on this too, for sure. So we often fall into two negative responses to sin. First one I've just highlighted, we fail to go to war. We deliberately sin by so little effort. The second one that often companions to it, we justify it, which we'll see in the scriptures is the rejection of the law of Moses, right? Okay, I don't have a highlight here. He, he warns those that reject the law of Moses. And I just want to point out to you when they talk about this rejection of the law of Moses in the in this section we just read that Jewish teachers recognized that everyone sinned in some ways but a sin in which a person declared I reject part of God's word was considered tantamount to rejecting the whole law and was reckoned as apostasy so just notice like the Jewish understanding of apostasy wasn't that you would just reject God altogether but that you would reject parts of God's law so they would say, if you, if you look at it and say, you know, um, I, I see the law, I see what God expects of me, but I don't agree with that part, and I'm not really going to follow that part. You, they would say, you've committed apostasy because you've rejected the whole law. Jesus backs that kind of teaching up as well, and I just want to remind us of that understanding of apostasy, because this is a trap that a lot of Western Christians fall into. And we've got to be real careful about this one. We've got to be real careful about what teachers we listen to, because it is a very common tactic to u- leverage things like, uh, we're going to use uh, word studies uh, that, that can easily get awry. We're going to use historical cultural context to take something the teachers taught, something that the scriptures taught for 2,000 years and say it somehow doesn't mean that. We see that leveraged in the case of homosexuality. Well, the scriptures actually never really talk about it. That word doesn't mean what you think it means. We see it in the case of uh, women as senior pastors and leadership. Like I, I've listened to people teaching uh, in the Fort Wayne area that would say, yeah, Paul gets it wrong when he says, that woman can't be an authority in the church, right? And, they, and he just gets it wrong. And I think, well, you're clearly rejecting parts of Scripture. And now we can fall in this trap too, right? We have to be careful lest we weigh in and put ourselves over Scripture. Because let me just be honest, when a human being says, I accept this part of God's Word and reject this part of God's Word, you are now being God over the Word, right? I'm putting myself in authority over the Word, and there's only one God, and either He's it or you're it. And there's no, the throne is not shared. 
So when humans do this, when we commit apostasy, either by rejecting the faith, by continuing to compromise, or rejecting parts of God's word, the scripture calls us out and says they profaned the blood of the covenant. And the idea here is, are you viewing Jesus' body as just another corpse, or is he really the atoning sacrifice whose blood has purified us? If I've just washed you and I've just cleaned you, remember, leveraging that temple analogy that we just spent weeks on in the book of Hebrews, I just washed you and purified you by the blood of the Lamb, and then you're going to go back and sinning again? Let's challenge us that way, profaning by the blood of the covenant. By the way, I just want to remind you, the blood of the covenant offers us complete grace, but not cheap grace. And it is the free gift of grace, but it's not offered cheaply. It costs God a son, and it's not accepted cheaply. It costs us our love and our loyalty, right? Secondly, he says, you, the person who commits apostasy or rejects God, you've outraged the spirit of grace. Acting like the grace is cheap means acting like God's sacrifice is meaningless outrages the spirit, and the Holy Spirit is no pushover, and the, the Holy Spirit is going to be outraged by our sin. And you'll hear more about that next week. I think I'm just going to tell you, Greg's whole sermon is going to be about outraging the Holy Spirit. And that's not true, but I'm putting you on the spot now, Greg. Um, the next one is, vengeance is mine and I'll repay. The, uh, another warning against this rejection of God's word is that you're going to receive vengeance from the Lord. The point is that there will be severe consequence for those who rejected God after knowing him. And again, we need to understand what direction are we heading. Where are those million little decisions leading us? We need to consider these words because the consequences are dire. Um, are any of you scared of heights? Anybody scared of heights? You know where I'm going to go with this. You're actually not scared of heights. Uh, you're, actually, you're actually not scared of falling. You're scared of the sudden stop of inertia when you hit the ground. Uh, well, we, one mission trip, we went to the Grand Canyon, and, and, uh, and you know, as a high schooler, I don't know what possessed my youth pastor to do this. Well, I think I'd know, but it's just a faulty bit of logic. He took us to the point, a point of the Grand Canyon when you could literally walk up to the edge, look down, and have a death drop, and there's no guardrail. Now, he's banking on, like, self-preservation, that a, that a high school boy has enough, like, brain power to preserve their lives by not getting too close to the edge. Uh, it's a risky move there. But the idea here, brothers and sisters, and why I'm referencing it is that, like, there is dire consequence if we get too close to the edge. Like, there are places we can go in life where you step off and take a fatal fall. There, I, vengeance is mine, God says. Like, there will be just consequences. And the prudent and wise person, sorry, the prudent and wise person st stays back a little bit, don't they? We don't toe the line. We don't compromise and get closer and closer. We stay back because we don't want one false step to send us tumbling to our deaths. Brothers and sisters, we take great pains to preserve our physical bodies. We don't get close to the ledges, but yet we sometimes fail to do that spiritually. Let me go, let me go to the next part of the sermon. He says he's going to encourage them to remember their past strength. So look, in the book of Hebrews, as this is the second time it's happened, he gave them a very strong warning. He's going to give them some great comfort in these words. This is a way to come for the church. But recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. He's going to encourage him with this, and we're going to pack what, these means, what this means for a second, but I'm going to follow up with one more challenge to us. I know I just spent the whole first point challenging us hardly, but I, but I think I want us to hear this point. I know I want us to hear this point as well. Um, we, I want to remind you that we have grown up a lot of, as, a, uh, as American Christians with an easy street faith. That we have sold, often sold the gospel as easy, it makes your life better, and again, you hear me drum on this occasionally. And let me just be honest, while, while Jaden does a good job of reminding me occasionally uh, a quote that he heard that, but the hardest thing you've ever experienced is still the hardest thing you've ever experienced. So it's okay that it's hard for us. But to challenge us on this and That this ought to challenge us to tough up and realize that many people in history and in other parts of the world currently have it much worse than you. Should I just go to the handheld? Yeah. I'm going to return that. Oh, thanks, Jaden. Thank you, because I was going to light on fire. I mean, it just, you know. This, 
my point is this, I want, this pa- passage should challenge us a little bit, right? Um, because, again, historically Christians and us sometimes have it much worse than we do. Now, again, for the sake of balance, not only should we have compassion because the toughest thing we've ever faced is the toughest thing we've ever faced, I also want to note that we ought to struggle for religious freedom, for morality and justice, but my encouragement to us as a church is that we need to do it for love of God and neighbor, not out of a pity party for our own selves, right? Because here's the truth of it. When you stand up and say, I'm going to follow Christ, you didn't choose the easy street, but you chose to climb Mount Everest. You chose to climb Mount Everest. And that is Mount Everest and a whole line of people trying to get up there. You know, and I just want to tell you that it is actually a good thing that we signed up for Mount Everest. You look at that and say, man, that's, that's hard. Yeah, it is. And that's a good thing. And while our, look, while our faith does bring a multitude of blessings, I just want to note that for us, really, I mean, really, if you look in the mirror, the easy street is boring and uncompelling. Deep inside of us, especially us as men, we want the mountain to climb. We want the satisfaction of knowing victory after hard struggle. And you doubt that? What about our obsession with sports? That's the whole point of sports, isn't it? To have the struggle, to have the competition, to step into the ring and win. You say, I'm not a sports guy. I, not many of us are these days, but we're a lot of board game and video game players. And you know how much science and math goes into and research goes into making a board game or a card game have just the right amount of struggle, not too hard that you never win, but not too easy that you win easily. They, there's a lot that goes into making it just the right amount of challenge so that you have that thrill of overcoming something difficult and finding success. My point is we are at our best when we have a challenge in front of us. And the Christian walk is challenging. Now here's the good part. Because of God's provision in our lives, we can be confident that we will make it. It's a hard climb, but we ought to be confident. And we will make the summit. Jesus has gone before us, and he walks alongside of us. He's the Sherpa with the guarantee. And even with the Sherpa's help, there's still an immense satisfaction in making the summit. We're not in this alone. But it's still a struggle, and it's still difficult. And you will get a well-done, good and faithful servant. God is going to strengthen the, the audience of Hebrews' faith with the words that he's just spoken. He said, remember all that you've been through? You can keep going. And I want to call us, because what they've been through, what we're going to unpack here in a moment, is much more difficult than maybe what a lot of us have been through. But I want to encourage us and challenge us to be mentally prepared. These are the days when you prepare yourself for the hard times to come. You don't, you don't think, when, when that big decision comes, maybe I don't know how I'll respond. You need to prepare yourself now for a, a potential outcome, a potential avenue of life, which is us facing severe persecution as believers. So what kind of things did they suffer? That he says, hey, remember when you overcame this. Keep going. Notice the first one, being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction. The Christians were openly mocked, blamed, and hated they hated by the Jews for corrupting the faith. They're hated by the Gentiles for the Christian opposition to the pluralistic society. Hey, the, the Roman Empire had a good thing going. Everybody just believe what you want to believe. We all, hey, we all just have our own faith, and they all kind of lead to the same place. The Christians come in and say, actually, you're all wrong. There's one God, and we've got him. Like, that's a hard message, right? Kind of disrupts society a little bit. He also says that they had compassion on those in prison. Um, you, the reality is, right, when, the, when a believer... Or anybody gets arrested at this time, the, the, the prison systems don't take great care of you. Like you might go without food and water. And so uh, you were relying upon other people to come in and bring you food and water, right? And so if I'm jailed because I'm a Christian and then someone comes in to bring me food and water, what do you think the odds are that they're a Christian too? Or they're a Christian sympathizer? And so the church, instead of living in fear, is saying, hey, uh, I'm sorry, our brother and sister's arrested, but we don't want to get arrested too, so we're just going to let you be there and suffer. No, we're going to come and bring you encouragement and bring you strength, and even if, even if that exposes us to danger, right? If you want to root out this church, an underground church, get one of them, and then, hey, we'll just keep coming and visiting you. And they expose themselves to that kind of danger. What courage, what faith they showed. And then lastly, they joyfully accepted the... Uh, oh, uh, joyfully accepted the plundering of their property since you knew you had a better and lasting one. It wasn't until 313 AD in, in the Edict of Milan that proclaimed permanently, or that proclaimed that the Christianity was an official religion of the Roman Empire. So the first 300 years, Christianity was not an official religion of the Roman Empire and would go through seasons where all the Christians' property would be stolen. 
that you could lose your house, you could lose your places of worship. It wasn't until 313 that they said, we're officially recognizing Christianity. I got a red light. Is that battery? Thanks. Oh, is this still working? Okay. I just thought I cut it all my end. It wasn't until then that they, that they could keep their property. Now, I, I just want to note, I think that would hawk me off quite a bit. I mean, I, I, how would I accept the fact if the government came in and said, Ryan, you're going to lose your house because you're a Christ follower? To have your property stolen from you because you're a Christian. And I look out there and say they joyfully accepted it. Like, I can't, it's hard for me to wrap my mind around that. The only way I can wrap my mind around people joyfully accepting the loss of their property is if I use an analogy, right? That scripture uses something very similar. If I had a million dollars at home, I don't really care if you take the 50 bucks out of my pocket, do I? Because I have something much greater than what you took. And in fact, if you stealing, if, if me re, uh, responding well to you stealing 50 bucks out of my pocket gets me another million dollars in heaven, great is your reward in heaven for those, right, that suffer under persecution, Take that 50 bucks all day long because it's earning for me way better interest than what I'd ever get in this life. And that, that, I mean, that's, that's the Christian worldview that challenges me. That's the Christian worldview that we try to talk about when we say living in the reality of heaven. If we live with kingdom perspective, with that end in mind, it reshapes how we view so many things, doesn't it? And it's when you live in the reality of heaven that you can joyfully accept the plunder of your property. That's why Matthew... 5, 11, blessed are those when men revile you and persecute you and say all types of false things against you. Rejoice and be glad. They knew they had a better treasure than anything on earth. Jaden's been working really hard on the technology stuff, and I'm really grateful for him. So thanks, buddy. How is God trying to strengthen the church against abandoning their faith, as some were doing, by reminding them of what they and their elders have been through beforehand? I say all that to say this. I, I, please don't take, please don't be ashamed. Please don't hear me as beating you up. This is the call to say, this is what our forefathers have gone through in the faith. This is what we can rise to. Like, we have the strength as Christians to suffer these type of things and do it joyfully. So we do not need to be in fear of them. And to compliment you, I have heard so many wonderful stories of people in this room who have gone through very difficult things because of their faith and have overcome and have handled them with joy. So I just want to say you guys are already demonstrating faithfulness in this, but continue, brothers and sisters, to prepare yourself because things might get a lot worse for us. This is the direction that we're heading. Are we preparing? Are we living? The last point of the sermon here is to endure with faith. To endure with faith. He goes on to say this. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. That's good words. For yet a little while, and then the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Man, that's good, good stuff there. I love it. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence. You know, at the opening of the sermon, I talked about that wrestling story. Um, it, it may be the obvious thing to say at this point that I lost that semifinals match. You know, I, I walked into that ring with a lack of confidence. And while I don't know what would have happened if I would have walked in with confidence, I do know that I lost because I lost confidence. I threw it away. Brothers and sisters, this is a clear call. Do not throw away our confidence in the gospel. Again and again in Hebrews, God is reminding us that great is the reward, that we will have the rest, the well done, that we'll be united with God and our brothers and sisters who have gone before us. That's our confidence, that there will come a day when there's no more tears, pain, death, or disease, that we can hold on to our confidence because God is with us and empowering us and sustaining us. We can have confidence, church. We can keep the end in mind, and we can walk with confidence. So don't get fearful. Don't get shaky. Don't get compromised by sin. Hold on. Hold on. For you have need of endurance so that you can done the will of God that we receive, so you can receive what was, what was promised. Uh, last week, we had a lot of fun 
didn't we? Uh, for those of you here, and if you didn't, it's a good one to watch just for that part of the sermon, uh, with some guys having fun with some dumbbells. Um, and Tom, again, I'm so grateful that uh, you spoke up and, and tried to be a little mouthy during the sermon. That just, that made my day. Uh, you know, and so we, the, the challenge was about hold the dumbbell out, right? And I, and I talked about how, the, depending on the prize at stake, might have changed your determination, right? What happens if you do it just for the sake of doing it versus some money on the line? And I want to remind you again that, look, anybody in this room can probably lift up a dumbbell, right? That's not the challenging part for most of us. The challenging part is endurance, right? It's not just the lift, it's the endurance of it. It hurt? What God tests us over is not our strength to be faithful once, but endurance. Can I continue to hold the weight? Can I continue to endure? Can I continue to run the race? And that's daunting, isn't it? Because so many times, if I could just hold it just for a little bit together, but then our muscles fail. And to think about, i got to hold this out for the rest of my life. Now, God's going to give you moments of rest. I just want to make note of that. But that's daunting. Now, here's where the gospel comes in. You don't hold that weight alone. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. And learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Brothers and sisters, God empowers me. God provides for me. God sustains me. Brothers and sisters, God empowers you. He provides for you. He sustains you. You don't hold it on your own. God provides us with the Holy Spirit that, and the divine strength that we need. So God has all the strength we need to hold up. And I need to stay connected to him and stay faithful in the little decisions so that I can receive that strength. And I need to commit what little willpower I have to holding on. God isn't, God isn't going to do it for us. We need to resist to the point of shedding blood. But God's going to give us everything we need to do it. You can do it because God is with you. Brothers and sisters, and then we say this, right? But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. We can have confidence. We can have confidence. Why? Because the victory is already won in Jesus, and all I need to do is, by faith, receive the victory. We're not going to compromise on the million little choices. We're going to receive God's empowering by the Spirit through faith and resist. We don't need to shrink back from the challenge. By faith, we're going to climb the mountain. We're going to receive God's strength by faith and endure. We're going to be confident in the reward by faith and have hope. We're going to believe that God will be with us by faith, and we're going to keep on believing and going. We're going to trust that God is sovereign all things, sovereign over all things by faith and have peace. And if you want to know why I'm talking about faith so much, come back the week after Easter. We'll talk about it in Hebrews 11. Let me pray. Father, I want to say thank you for the, the, the challenge and hopefully the encouragement today. And I'm grateful for the good testimony of this body already. But God, we, we um, ask that you would strengthen us and give us endurance for the days ahead. Maybe count the cost today and say, God, no matter what, I'm not shrinking back. No matter what, I'm having confidence in you. No matter what, you're going to get me to the finish line because I'm going to be running with you. And we just thank you for that hope we can have in you. And thank you the role of faith. Thank you that the role, of, the role that faith plays in that. That we can trust so many things by faith. The certainty of things hoped for. The conviction of things not seen. We can have that because of you. God, I ask that you'd help us to, to wrestle with anything you need to wrestle with today. And be encouraged by the gospel. And may we leave here blessed. Just thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, church family, if you want during this last song, you're welcome just to sit and to, to pray or to stand and sing or, or, or a mixture of, of either of those things, whatever uh, you need to do to respond to this challenge to endure and to remember God's grace and remember what he has done for us and that we don't have to hold our weights alone. So let's sing to Jesus today. May we be dependent And may we let go of pride Will you turn our hearts around Will you change us from the inside We're ready to trust you We gladly lay it down we surrender and worship 
Oh Lord, make our knees hit the ground. Cause Jesus, you're better. strong and bold will you captivate us here we're ready to trust you we gladly lay down we surrender Make our knees hit the ground Cause Jesus, you're better Father, we thank you that you are better. Jesus, you are so much better than any treasure this world could ever give. Church family, may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, who is the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, may he equip you with everything good that you might do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, 
to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Love you so much. Have a blessed week.